There we go. We're using Wi-Fi, so nobody get on Wi-Fi right now for a little bit to do Google Slides. We'll be all good. Go for it. There's only one demo, and we've got him hard hardwired. Good morning, everyone. So um, just a quick intro. I'm glad, by the way, that Diane is in my team, and she knows what my responsibilities are. <laughs> So I'm Reza Shafi. I come from uh, CoreOS. I, I run the uh, product team at CoreOS prior to the, to the acquisition. have been here now almost a year since the acquisition, and now uh, responsible for the product along with Joe Fernandez, who is also here. Um, so, so we run the, the product teams for OpenShift together. So happy to be here with, with Chris, who is going to be joining me in, in just a bit. But before I get, uh, I get Chris, Chris on board, just wanted to talk a little bit about why, why does it matter, right? At least a perspective on why what we're all doing with OpenShift matters. And to talk about that, I'm going to start, and by the way, we're going to see a lot of tweets here because a couple of announcements coming up as we're speaking. All right. <laughs> it's kind of interesting to see it on the side. Usually get a Matt Diane and much uh, a Mac yeah, much easier. Right all right. <laughs> this is for all the PowerPoint people. I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna do that. That's okay. We'll we'll live with notifications. It's gonna be a good update for everyone. Yeah. Keep talking. All right. So 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 why does it matter? And I'm going to go back fifteen years <clears throat> to an article that, that basically said it doesn't matter. Right? And I remember being uh, a young consultant at the time. This article actually had quite a bit of you know, momentum and, and traction in the industry at the time. And people were talking about how our industry uh, is, is about to, to go you know, nowhere. I was actually worried about my career as people were talking about this. Um, and you know, the, the argument that Nicholas Carr was making was that IT, like electricity and like railroads in their time, is going to become commoditized. And um, organizations are not going to need IT, uh, are not going to need to innovate in IT in order to be successful. It's just a commodity that you just use. And so let me just get a quick um, poll from the audience here. Who thinks, 15 years later now, who thinks that Nicholas Carr was right? Okay, good. Almost no hand. Good. <laughs> well, I, I, I would say he was half right, so let's talk about that. Uh, I'm just going to look at the last 24 hours for me. I used Uber to, to go to the airport and come to the hotel. They've definitely used IT to disrupt their industry. And then I have done my expenses throughout this time with Concur which, by the way, is a, is a great customer of ours, local here. And again, they have disrupted the way I do my expenses compared to the way I was doing it with um, other software, let's say, 15 years ago, which was a lot more painful. And then um, in the airplane, I used my phone to you know, access an array of uh, videos and entertainment from, from United. And again, that has completely changed the way that entertainment was being delivered in airplanes. And by the way, I was playing around with OpenShift 4, and doing so, I was just uh, accessing resources at the infrastructure level on Amazon AWS. <clears throat> so on that last one, I would like to say, I was accessing those compute resources like a commodity. I was getting it like a utility. And so even though in the first three scenarios, I would say Nicholas Carr wasn't right, in the last one, he was probably right. So what's happening here? I think it depends how you look at it. If you look at it from the different layers, from a computing infrastructure, to use the words from the article, uh, getting towards boring necessity to operations, computing infrastructure is slowly getting there. But if you go one layer up, the services that we use to build applications today, 
I think you can see that innovation is still very much alive. You look, you know, I was just coming up the stairs here. Technologies like VTES, right? Technologies like etcd, which by the way, you're gonna hear more about tomorrow at the keynote, uh, not to spoil anything. Uh, and technologies like CockroachDB, and, and the list goes on and on, on and on. The, the innovation at the computing services layer has not stopped. And if you go one level higher than that, applications, the applications that we're all building in our organizations that you're building to get your business to, to be more successful, well, innovation has definitely not stopped at that level. And I would venture to say that the same is true for the electricity example that was used in the IT Doesn't Matter article. Yes, it's true that the electrical infrastructure level is getting to be a boring, it probably has been for a long time, a boring necessity to operations. But if you go one level up, you know, I was just at a Starbucks on my way here again, I put my phone on the table and it started charging. That's innovation at the services level, at the electrical services level, and of course at the appliance level. Electrical appliances are innovating all the time. Now here's a difference though between electricity and where we're going with our applications and computing services. If you look at these pictures, they're pictures of very early electrical appliances. You see a hair straightener, bottom left, a toaster on the right, a food warmer on the top left. And you'll notice something that's maybe a little odd but common to all of them in that they've got a little light bulb plug at the bottom. That's because electricity was first brought to the homes for lighting. But then people notice it's just electricity and I can just plug any appliance into it, and so they started creating devices or applications that plugged into the electrical service using that plug. And in some ways, that was a blessing in disguise because it provided decoupling from the electrical infrastructure provider. So it didn't matter whether it was Tesla or Edison or whoever else who was coming up with the electrical infrastructure, your applications were decoupled from it. I'm worried that the way things are going right now, because of the trade-offs we have to make every day for flexibility and speed, that is not the way we're going with the application and software world, and IT world. In fact, as we're tying ourselves to the services, to the computing services provided by the cloud providers, whether it's at the serverless functions level, whether it's at the queuing level, they are deeply integrated with the underlying infrastructure. And that's, those, are, those are ties that are hard to break. It's like saying your toaster works with the Washington State University or electricity here, but sorry, if you go to San Francisco, you can't move that toaster. You gotta buy a new toaster. And so this is why I think OpenShift matters. If you look at the things we're working on, it's all about getting to a point where you don't have to trade off between that flexibility and the simplicity of the cloud and the diverse ecosystem of services that are out there, the open community that's out there, so that they all operate like a cloud, so that your applications can be truly portable and move anywhere. And that's, that's really it. And so what are we doing? You know, big themes, obviously, you know, the OpenShift team bet on Kubernetes a while ago. Looks like a good bet now. Um, and and CoreOS was, was there with them. We're also talking about automated operations, and you'll hear us talk a lot more about automated operations. Um, something that's at the core of OpenShift 4 that brings the simplicity of the cloud from the operating system all the way up. And not just up to the Kubernetes level, but beyond that for the services that are running on it. Services from all the providers that are out there, all the open core and open source services that are out there, not just cloud provider services, so that they can act and behave like cloud services. And things like the operator framework are there to do that, um, and that's, that's another aspect of what we're working on. So, with that being said, let me pass it on to, to Chris Wright, our CTO, to talk a bit more about what we're doing 
uh, along these lines. Thank you. I should start tweeting to Diane and just have a conversation with myself here. Um, good morning and welcome to sunny Seattle. Uh, I, I personally am from the Northwest and I recently moved to Boston and I can say it's really cold out there and it's sunny, but uh, I actually feel nice here back in the Northwest. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is some of the things that we're doing in terms of collaboration um, across communities, a little bit of like technology, say like sneak previews of where we're going and really think about what are we building together? So my perspective is um, a hybrid cloud is an, is an opportunity to really create total independence for your applications from from the underlying infrastructure. And this is something that if you think about Linux and what Linux did, this is something that we've been doing as an industry for quite a long period of time. So Linux created the opportunity to run uh, applications in a consistent runtime environment, independent of the underlying hardware. A hybrid cloud gives us that same capability using Kubernetes to do distributed computing and allowing us to place those applications on public clouds or within your own uh, data center, private cloud or, or even virtualized or bare metal deployment. So that's a lot of, uh, you know, that, that's really I think what we're building. I think that's the, the, the most exciting part to me. And if you think about what is a cloud, I would describe a cloud as two key things. One is basically ease of operations. You, you, you've essentially outsourced your operations to somebody else. Run the infrastructure for me. I'm just going to consume it through APIs. Uh, that creates a lot of benefits. It's a really efficient way from a, from a consumer perspective to use the infrastructure. Another key piece to a cloud is what I would describe as differing levels of abstraction or ways to engage with the cloud or services that you consume from the cloud. So a cloud isn't just easy to use, but it's a breadth of services. And what I'm really excited about with the hybrid cloud is we have this opportunity to create an ecosystem of services that run on top of a consistent, you know, uh, call it a fabric or whatever you want, whatever sort of buzzword you want to use, a consistent platform for, for and a community for creating this ecosystem of best of breed services that we can really run anywhere. So one of the things that I think Kubernetes has done a really great job of focusing on is bringing applications, containerized applications, sort of the you know, modern software architected microservices type of applications to cloud environments. We haven't done as much work as a community focused on, on bare metal. And one of the things that I find interesting is over the last roughly year or so, in talking to customers and users, there's this increased interest in running Kubernetes directly on bare metal. So you could argue we've spent a whole long period of time trying to convince ourselves that hardware just doesn't matter, it's irrelevant, it's kind of this homogenous commodity, you just use compute. And what I, what I think is happening today is we're discovering that certain types of workloads can benefit from running directly on bare metal, maybe it's access to specific hardware, um, maybe it's a specific footprint or, or environment that you need to operate within, like forthcoming 5G environments with uh, mobile edge or multi-axis edge computing where you have really limited footprint. So bare metal, I think, is something that we're starting to look at more within Red Hat. It's an opportunity for us to do some collaboration, and it's an interesting kind of collaboration across communities. Uh, we're working in some context with folks from the OpenStack community to do some of the bare metal provisioning pieces. 
and really trying to create a bare metal environment that has that same ease of use, fully automated, easy to upgrade, um, that we're building virtualized, especially in public cloud. So the, uh, to me, this is a, a new phase for, for Kubernetes, a new opportunity, a new way to look at what we're doing with Kubernetes to deploy into a new environment uh, on bare metal. Another piece that I think is interesting here is we have an opportunity to think of application deployment as managed by, say, a single cluster manager and scheduler. So we've been working on this project called KubeVert for quite some time. And when you combine something like bare metal provisioning and KubeVert, you get an environment where you have containers and VMs as peers and first class citizens that sit right side by side with one another. So the applications that we've spent the last decade building in virtual machines, we don't have to just abandon. We can easily integrate them together in, in a single environment. Uh, again, managed simply. Uh, we talked a little bit, Reza mentioned operators, this kind of uh, ease of deployment. And I think that's a really cool opportunity. It's kind of a converged infrastructure that gives us a place to run applications, uh, you know, independent of the, the you know, virtualization technology. So kind of a next generation way to look at infrastructure and for applications. And I think I already mentioned the, the performance sensitive pieces, but an, a great example there is the use of GPUs and FPGAs for machine learning workloads. So there's the machine learning SIG here in OpenShift Commons. And one of the things that we're hearing a lot from users of Kubernetes is um, it's a, maybe to put it simply, I think we would probably all agree, Kubernetes is one. Kubernetes is the de facto standard for how we do cluster management and scheduling uh, of applications across Linux clusters. What that means is the entire industry is collaborating and focused on a common platform. And as an example, bringing data-centric machine learning workloads to the same platform is something that we're seeing a lot of interest in. And so things like performance-sensitive applications where we want direct access to a GPU to accelerate the machine learning environment um, is something that we see community enthusiasm around and, and, and customers are starting to use that as a common building block for their internal you know, applications and, and infrastructure. So another piece that I think is interesting is initially we spent a lot of time like how, how big can we scale these clusters? We, there's, a, there's been some scale labs and a lot of blog posts on how many hundreds or thousands of nodes we can scale to. And that's important and it's interesting. And we also have to consider what is the kind of impact of a large scale cluster. Well, you know, there, there's, there are some fundamental scaling challenges. There's the question of um, what does your blast radius look like when you've consolidated onto a single cluster? There's geographic issues as you're trying to spread your applications around the world. There's on-premise, off-premise when you talk about a hybrid cloud environment. So what we're starting to see is more and more interest in running more smaller clusters rather than fewer larger clusters. And here's some examples on the screen of things like um, edge environments, where just by definition, you have a lot of different small clusters. Maybe direct locality, cl uh, proximity to data, data generation for those machine learning or analytic workloads that are, that are thriving from all the data that's maybe, you know, in this example, <laughs> on, a, on a remote rig. Um, maybe it's security and compliance issues, where your data sits, uh, how you partition your application base. Um, access to specific kinds of, of hardware, so maybe a specialized cluster, and uh, you know, using different types of hardware. So a lot of different reasons that you might see rationale behind deploying multiple smaller clusters, which introduces a new challenge. Like scaling up, well, it's hard and it's fun for performance engineering, um, but we kind of understand what it means from an identity perspective, 
a storage perspective, a networking perspective when it's one large cluster. When we have multiple clusters, we create a new set of challenges for ourselves. So this is an area that has been underway um, in the Kubernetes community for quite some time. And we are slowly bringing this technology into OpenShift and creating uh, a federation capability that will really allow us to take advantage of deploying clusters where they should go and then deploying applications to the correct cluster over time. And again, we can't trivialize what it means to replicate the data across all the clusters where applications may need to land. Or what does networking look like in a context where you need to direct to the right cluster, you want to feel like it's a seamless interconnection across all of the clusters. Now, these are not native functionalities in, in Kubernetes today. This is how we can advance the state of the art. Already in uh, OpenShift 3.11, we have the cluster registry, so you can register a cluster as you bring it online. Um, and we're working towards things like workload placement and policy associated with that. So that you can think in terms of, uh, you know, again, from an application developer perspective, how can we ease deployment and have this, the system take over and push the application to the right location, maybe take advantage uh, of a hardware accelerated environment that, that your application may ultimately be dependent on to, to deliver its SLA. So this, to me, is, is a view of where we're trying to go with, with cluster federation. And we can take a look at a simple use case. Uh, here, the developer is using the federation control plane to do the initial workload placement. And the initial workload placement was pushed to a, a bare metal cluster uh, of, of Kubernetes. Now, for whatever reason, uh, could be policy dependent or point in time doing some, some upgrades, uh, the developer decides that it's time to push that application to a different infrastructure. So here we're showing something moving the application to uh, a cloud cluster, cloud-based cluster. And what's cool about this is we're pushing the real behind the scenes work uh, into automated uh, routines so that you can specify how you want to deploy the, the application and have the system slowly reconcile things like ensure that the data is properly replicated and the application can move to the right location. You get ingress routing to the application appropriately so you're not bouncing all over the place. And ultimately, uh, our goal here is to make these collection of clusters feel seamlessly um, you know, independent so that they really look like one large place to deploy applications even though they're, they're managed as separate clusters. So if you're interested in that, we've got a couple folks here. I don't see Paul. He's usually easy to identify. Um, and, and Ivan. And you know, here's the GitHub repo. We have this, this demo that we've been working on that shows application portability. Uh, and this is just a, a way that you can get directly involved in, in federation. So that some, some work has already started. Uh, you know, the cluster registry is, is, a, is already there, but there's a lot of work to do to really fill it out to the full vision of how do we create co a completely federated clusters. Another area that shows this de facto standardization around Kubernetes is um, the work we've seen in the serverless space. So it's not... Uh, it, you know, it's not new to the industry. We've t been hearing a lot about serverless, especially in the context of AW uh, AWS and Lambda. It's demonstrated some real interesting capabilities of um, making it as easy as possible for developers to create applications or, or functional logic. In the uh, CNCF serverless working group, there's quite a few different projects associated with that. And where I see the de facto standardization of Kubernetes winning, showing itself, is in the Knative project. So this was launched back in July. And what Knative is, literally, Kubernetes native functionality to support the primitives needed to build serverless environments or serverless platforms. So the, the primitives of connecting to event sources, 
building images that will be launched based on those events, scaling from zero and back to zero based on, uh, on the events associated with, this, with the service or, or function that you're trying to, to support. These are the kind of the core building blocks. And we're really excited to announce just today, a few minutes ago, that we have in OpenShift uh, developer previews of Knative on, on OpenShift. And again, this is just the beginning of building an infrastructure that allows you to create functions that run entirely independently of that underlying infrastructure. So the, the specialized socket that Reza was talking about and the, the potentially vertically integrated stack that you find um, from one single provider is something that we can neutralize and, and turn into a broad scale industry initiative using technology like, like Knative. We've got operators, and operators are an example of creating that ease of use that we uh, mentioned in the beginning of what is a cloud. You've heard a lot about operators. This is just an example of a single operator comparing uh, simple containerization through cloud service to operators on Kubernetes, which gives you the breadth of um, availability across many platforms. And ultimately, if you look in commons, there's something like 50 operators, and this is a space where we have the opportunity to create that not the pure ease of operations, but also the breadth of ecosystem support uh, for a hybrid cloud vision. So this is something that I think is, is a really great um, advance, state-of-the-art advance, and it's a place where the ecosystem fundamentally matters. And this, to me, all adds up to something I gotta give uh, kudos to Reza for the, the slide and the quote, but it all adds up to something where what we're trying to build is a future vision where it's automated operations. It's so simple to use, it runs like a cloud. I use the ter term autonomous cl cluster. Uh, Daniel Reek, who's here somewhere, uses the term self-driving cluster. We're really moving in a direction where everything that we do enables machines to manage the clusters and developers to build the applications that are disruptive and, and really uh, bringing innovation to the industry and providing that uh, platform for really the next generation of, of businesses and, and, and opportunities. So with that, thank you for coming to the Commons and look forward to collaborating with you throughout the week.